Welcome to the Literary Life Podcast. We've grown quite significantly since our debut in 2019, and we've had many requests to highlight older episodes that new listeners may have missed, as well as revisit listener favorites. To honor that request, I present to you this episode of the Best of the Literary Life Podcast. Welcome to the Literary Life Podcast, where your hosts, Angelina Stanford and Cindy Rollins, explore a life shaped by books, stories, and poetry. Each week, we will rescue story from the ivory tower and bring it to your couch, your kitchen, and your commute. The literary life is for everyone, because in the words of Stratford Caldecott, to be enchanted by story is to be granted a deeper insight into reality. Hello and welcome back to the Literary Life Podcast. I am Angelina Stanford and today with me, the the dynamic duo, the not Jekyll and Hyde uh, of of Thomas Banks and Sidney Rollins are going to help me to finish up Robert Louis Stevenson's The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Hello, hello. (laughs) Hello. That's my in a world where a doctor has drugs. <laughs> That's my movie announcer voices. I'm not going to give up my day job. No, no. You, 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 you I, just I, need to sound creepier is all. It's probably, probably good Deeper to you. in yeah. a world. Some sort of we some, need some, some weird music also. Some yeah. really <laughs> weird, eerie music. Alerting us to when something's going to go badly wrong. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So we are back for a part two. Last time was mostly an introduction. We just got through the very beginning, the first couple of sections, and now we're going to be able to jump into the book as a whole. And um, oh, it was great fun reading this again. Um, Just, oh, I don't even know the first time I read this. This is a longtime favorite of mine. Um, So before we get into that, um, Cindy, you are still at the beach. Lucky you. I have been at the beach longer than I've ever been. I just got rushed over, got a nice boat ride from my brother-in-law and, uh, and now have decided to buy the, his boat from him. <laughs> so, really? I actually think I might. Wow. Things, well, this is quite the vacation. Things I know it's turning into just like a dream come true. So, oh, uh, I'm so anyway, glad for you. It's you, kind of you, fun. you deserve it. And you've had a lot on your plate especially lately. So I'm so glad you're getting a chance to, to unwind and relax and get your feet in the sand because this Thank is you. constantly telling me she's a Florida girl and you're yes. like a superhero, right? If you don't get your feet in the sand, you just wither away. You got to recharge, right? Absolutely. And I'm getting a nice long recharge right now. All right. That's good to know. I see I'm, I'm from the swamp and I don't even want to go there. What that means for me. I need to go back to the swamp to recharge? No, I think mm. not. Alligators well, you have your, stuff, so. you know, what does Thomas make for you? Uh, your your swamp food? <laughs> My swamp food? <laughs> it's all from the cookbook, the, the great Louisiana book of swamp food. <laughs> Wow, Cindy's going to be canceled by me and my entire people. We are proud of not many things, but of our food, we are greatly proud. Um, now, Mr. Banks, you still have your webinar coming up on the French Revolution. Tell us again when that is and where we can find out about it. So that is going to be on the evening of September 23rd. And I will be talking about the, um, well, you know, the, the basic history of the French Revolution, its causes and effects, and also the uh, some biographical sketches of the people who were its directors and its victims. And those are actually turn out to be basically the same people. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, <laughs> Isn't there yeah. a Bible verse about that? <laughs> something right. about that. Something you fell about into the pit you dug for someone else. Or sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind. It's, yeah, so it's, so yes, how, how the French Revolution, you know, begins in the name of overthrowing despotism. And to do that, it creates a, a despotism and all the, all the wonderful ironies that that entails. Oh boy. So yeah, that's on the time to, time to learn. Yes. Oh Amen. man. Immediately. I was thinking of that line from the William Blake poem, mock on, mock on Voltaire Rousseau, where he said, that's mm-hmm. one of my favorite lines. Where he says, you throw the sand into the wind and the wind blows it back again. Oh, very good. Yeah. And that's, that's modern that's politics yeah. all summed up for us. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So yes, you can find out about that at houseofhumaneletters.com and live or later as always, lifetime access to those videos. And of course, you want to be checking out Cindy's new podcast, The New Mason Jar, uh, which is booming. 
And of course, she's also got her best-selling books you can check out. So her website is morningtimeformoms.com and you can find out all about what she's got going on on the side as well. All right, gang, you know what time it is. It's commonplace time. Mr. Banks threw down some, he threw down the gauntlet this morning. He said he had picked out a quote I would like. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. So yeah, I, it's it's a subject I know dear to to Angelina's heart. You know the um, the demystification of the heavens and all that kind of thing. Oh, so, indeed. So this is uh, from the early nineteenth century German Romantic writer Heinrich Heine, and he's talking to, to contextualize this quote. Um, he's talking about a conversation he once had with his mentor, the philosopher uh, George Hegel. So one beautiful starry skyed evening, we two stood next to each other at a window. And I, a young man of about 22, who had just eaten well and had good coffee, enthused about the stars and called them the abode of the blessed. But the master grumbled to himself, the stars, <laughs> the stars are only a gleaming leprosy in the sky, he said. You know what that really reminds me of is there's that wow. part in Voyage of the Dawn Treader when they're talking to that fallen star. Do you remember that, Cindy? And Eustace oh. says, a star how can you be a star that's just a big ball of gas and he says something like you know well no that's what you think a star is but that is not what a star is kind of thing um so here we have sort of eustace unredeemed grown old and cranky this is where he where he would have been if yeah he not. exactly so exactly so all right cindy what do you got for us oh boy i'm still all right i'm gonna go with charlotte mason um from ourselves okay I wanted to do something from a gift from, from the sea by Ann Mara Lindbergh, but I, I haven't narrowed those down yet. So here's Charlotte Mason. It is a mistake, perhaps, to think that to do one thing well, we must just do and think about that and nothing else all the time. It is our business to know all we can and to spend a part of our lives in increasing our knowledge of nature and art, of literature and man, of past and the present. That is one way in which we become greater persons. And the more a person is, the better he will do whatever piece of special work falls to his share. Hmm. That's the end of that. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's, that's so good. My brain's going in a million different directions, right? So we, we get a training in how to be human and then we can be prepared no matter for all what our specialty. We should right. know what we be learning of everything we can about the world. Oh, what uh, about you? Do you have a comment? Okay, well, if you've got your Lit Life bingo card out, if so you can mark the Charlotte Mason Square, and now you can also mark the Northrop Fry Square. So we're going to play according to, to type today, Cindy. So I actually might have shared this on the podcast before. I don't remember, but a number of people in the Lit Life group are reading Northrop Fry's The Educated Imagination, which is one of my favorite volumes of his. It's very, very small. And um, so I pulled it out to reread it while others were reading, reading it. And so, of course, <laughs> the quotes I've all underlined seem extra relevant again. So I may have, for, forgive me if I already shared this one, but, it, but, but I think it, it, it says something really important about how stories work. And I think it's very applicable to what RLS was doing. He's going to say poet, but he's using poet here in the ancient sense as storyteller. The poet's job is not to tell you what happened, but what happens. Not what did take place, but the kind of thing that always takes place. Oh, wow. I like that. Yeah, that's really, that gives you a lot to think about. It, it really does. And, and I think it's so appropriate for this book. I, I think uh, Lewis's wife, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's wife was right on when she recognizes this was an allegory. This is, this is big time the story of what always happens when you indulge mm. the passions, right? They, they end up taking over you. This is the thing that always takes place. Um, mm. So yeah. before we jump in, let's solve the mystery. Boy, you guys got heated on the Facebook group this week about is it Louis or Lewis? So Cindy mentioned I had never, Mr. Banks and I, I got to back it up here. Mr. Banks and I had never, ever heard anyone say anything other than Lewis. And so to our shock, Cindy said that some of the audiobook narrators said Louis. And of course, I, I heard that Richard Armitage said Louis. 
And I realized that that's rough on us because we have some big Armitage fans and we don't like the idea that he could possibly be wrong. So we're just going to say it's not his fault. He does have a producer. Yes. Well, we can blame it on his producer. It is the producer's fault. He is the actor and he, yeah, that somebody else should have caught this. So we did a little research because obviously it's spelled Louis, but we've always heard it pronounced Louis. So we did some research. We do have the definitive answer now. Um, his name was Robert Louis Balfour Stevens, spelled L-E-W-I-S. And even as a child, he never went by Robert. He always be- went by Louis, L-E-W-I-S. Hmm. At some point after college, he changed the spelling of his name to L-O-U-I-S, but kept the L-E-W-I-S pronunciation. So he gallicized the spelling, but not the pronunciation. Right. Okay. So he, it is Louis Stevenson. And so we can consider the matter closed. So I'm so sorry to all the Rimturn Armitage fans out there. I and Cindy, I know we're both huge fans of Armitage's readings. Um, he's he's a really, really good reader. But so we're gonna we're gonna blame this on him. We're gonna blame this on his producer. The producer should have known how to pronounce the name of the author. Yeah. In a way, it's kind of interesting because maybe we've all just grown up, those of us who are older have grown up hearing it as Lewis. But maybe someone coming to it fresh would just assume it's Louie and, and have not having that history. Right. No, that makes that actually makes sense. Um, and and I know it's spelled Louis, and I never stopped to think why it was pronounced Lewis instead of Louis. But now we know there was a reason. His name actually is L-E-W-I-S, like C.S. Lewis. Maybe this is a foolish question, to, but did people actually call him by his initials? Um, I mean, you, you referred to RLS. I keep, okay, the so the reason why I'm saying RLS is because I also quote C.S. Lewis all the time. And mm. last week I was quoting both Robert Louis Stevenson and C.S. Lewis, and I was calling them both Lewis. Ah. So I thought that would be super confusing. So yeah. I was okay. calling him RLS, not because I think anybody calls him that, but because I'm trying to distinguish between the two Lewises, neither of whom are Louis. Yeah, I was just wondering, because yeah. I was thinking, I mean, like, that's... I mean, doesn't that kind of represent a triumph if people can refer to you by your initials and still everyone knows who you are? It's right up there with Madonna, Napoleon, like just and by Cher. the first name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Well, crossword puzzles frequently um, use RLS for as, oh. uh, because you know it's it's if you are in a bind and you need a word that doesn't have any vowels, they refer to Robert Louis Stevenson's works and they'll and and it'll be a three letter word and you'll know it's oh. RLS. That is very good to know. Wow. That will help some of you out there. <laughs> that will. That will. Okay, guys. So here we are, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I was so delighted to see people in the Facebook group saying they had never read this book before. And for whatever reason, they kind of had a mental block about it. For some people, it was literally the book that they've avoided in the reading challenge, which is so yeah. sweet to me. Um, but I guess they worked it up as maybe a Victorian novel or it was going to be hard or whatever. And so they started reading it and found out, wow, actually, I flew through this and I couldn't put it down. And what a mesmerizing story. Um, And I heard the Richard Armitage audio was amazing, that he did a really good job. Mm. Richard Armitage, if you would like to become the sponsor of this podcast, (laughs) um, contact Atlee immediately. (laughs) No, contact me. (laughs) Oh, oh, but um, bum Just Uh, kidding, just kidding, just a joke. (laughs) The sand is going to her head, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) All right. So there's a lot I want to say. There's a, I guess we should just kind of go through chapter by chapter, but I also want to talk about the story as a whole and also the way it's written because with the changing narrators, there is something very clever about the way he has this story unfold and he hides from the reader, the true identity of Hyde and they're in the relationship to Jekyll. And um, I think there is something really, really clever and powerful about having so much of our impression of Hyde be through other people's eyes, like always seeing other people respond to Hyde. And that's how we get our sense of who he is. Where if we started off the story, mm-hmm. and really I'd love to know about the draft that he destroyed, because maybe he, maybe he wrote it this way originally, but I think it would be much less powerful if we started off with Henry Jekyll's narrative and like started right. like at the chronological right. beginning with I've been experimenting with this and now I'm high, like watching it unfold and knowing. 
I think I, it'd be less powerful. I, I would, I'm inclined to agree, I guess. I mean, it seems like any great thriller or um, any kind of story involving suspense is going to have to start off with some, if not misdirections, at least play upon the reader's patience, um, you know, to, to, if, you're, if you're building up to some, some kind of climax. I mean, because in a different way, I mean, um, you know, Frankenstein does the I same thought a thing. lot about Frankenstein, Frankenstein while reading. Begin yep, with I thought Victor about Frank that too. It begins with the ship's captain, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it begins way to Walton. You know, yeah, yes, exactly. So, um, and, and there's a lot of similarities where you have somebody using science mm -hmm. um, to solve spiritual issues. So here we have Dr. Jekyll trying to use science um, to solve the issue of the fact that man has a fallen nature. Yeah. Um, and he thinks we can just sort of scientifically divide that and then be our best selves. Uh, and in Frankenstein, he's trying to solve the problem of mortality, which is not just a physical problem. It's a spiritual problem. So he's trying to achieve immortal life and resurrection it, through science. Viewed from the outside, also in both of those instances, you have a, a scientist who is um, also a humanitarian, someone who like mm. from viewed from the outside would seem almost as perfect as a human being could be mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's almost it's almost as if uh, you know the the tragic flaw within them is the desire itself and that that desire is the first corruption which leads to others oh very much so i, um, I think i think both of them you have the forbidden knowledge thing mm -hmm. they've um they've crossed forbidden lines and um I, I think both of these stories have this in common uh, this is a very very old idea um and you see a shift actually in the way forbidden knowledge is portrayed in books. So Frankenstein, um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, earlier books show that when you reach out and grab the apple, the forbidden fruit, that you are bringing destruction onto your head. Um, I love that both of those books show it in term, uh, metaphorically in terms of you've created a monster now and that monster is going to destroy you. Uh, and it is not going to be, you know, the keys to the door of, of life. It, it's going to be, it's going to be hell. And of course, that's an essential part of Dante's Inferno, that every act of sin is an act of self-destruction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this go It even goes back in a much broader way to what Charlotte Mason says about education, because she says there are things that we may not do in order to educate a child. We have we manipulation for one thing is one mm -hmm. is one of the things that we're not allowed to do but if you have this feeling of, of of manipulation is often often comes from a place of wanting to help someone do better in what they're doing um, so it comes from a good place but it goes it it breaks the rules it breaks the law uh, and how, automatically has a destructive consequence right and 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 we can't see that be, because we think of the good motive of, of the person but that is but good motives are not enough we have no, that's exactly agree. right and, and dr jekyll and dr frankenstein have good motives frankenstein is talking a whole lot about how imagine the implications of this all the lives i'm going to be able to save and and people are going to talk about me as this great hero of humanity um, and Jekyll thinks that he stumbled on that too. So then you fast forward to more um, you know, 20th century and 21st century storytelling. We don't, not, we don't even have a concept of forbidden knowledge. We think the idea that anything is forbidden to us is ridiculous. Like, how dare you? Um, and so we, our motto is no boundaries, no mm -hmm. fear. All reach for what you want and take it. Um, and, and we actually portray that um, much more in a Prometheus light, that this is an act of liberation. It's an act of courage. To take what's forbidden is courageous and leads to freedom. Whereas, and we also see people that feel like they also, because they have our good in mind, they're allowed to en encroach upon our humanity. And, and um, it, it, we just see that every day now, where mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the motive of someone to take over our lives is that it's for our own good. And we talked about on the magic episode, uh, technology as, as essentially being the modern magic. It's the way that we can manipulate and control nature and reality and man. Um, so if you're interested in that discussion, you'll want to go back and listen to the magic episode. But um, it strikes me that Robert Louis Stevenson, as well as Mary Shelley, because I do think those books are very similar, um, are, are in particular showing that um, 
there's a particular temptation with scientific knowledge, right? That you're, yeah. that, that you can dabble yeah. in forbidden things in science. I mean, so Dr. Jekyll is a scientist. Dr. Frankenstein is a scientist, but they are just the latest incarnation of the magician, the uncle Andrew, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, in terms of story archetypes, there's almost no difference between the mad scientist in the attic and the mad magician. Well, there was also a sense, and, and I, you know more about medieval times, but uh, body snatching or for scientific purposes was mm-hmm. considered immoral. Mm-hmm. And you couldn't use, you couldn't do autopsies and you couldn't do these things because um, they, the, they looked at the human body as sacred after it was dead not sacred or magical, but, you know, it had requiring dignity and that a, a, a doctor didn't have any right to desecrate a body just to mm-hmm. get information. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's probably caring. We would obviously all be glad that they have found out what's going on in our bodies, but. But at the same time, you know, the, the trade-off there um, has been that perhaps culturally we, we don't treat uh human beings as sacred made in the image of god Mm -hmm. right we've lost something like one of the i'm just going to go off on a tangent here um and i love mystery stories and back when those csi shows started like 400 years ago when the series started i I watched them because i'm like hey man show me but but give me a mystery show i did some detectives solving a crime i'm going to be there but I very quickly stopped watching any of those. And it was because I did not like the way that the human body was treated on those shows. The dehumanizations of the, of the corpses. I mean, these are, I don't want to hear about the Vic. This is a human being. This is a lost soul. And I don't, I don't want to hear, did you process the body? Like I, I, and I understand if you're listening to this and you're in that field that every field has its lingo. I'm just saying in terms of storytelling, I did not appreciate the deep loss of humanity in the show. And I don't even know if I'm making any sense here, but I, I, I yeah, I don't need to see close-ups of autopsies. I don't, <laughs> that did not, that was not good for my Certainly soul. Certainly not during a meal, no. I, <laughs> well, I, I there's it, something- that one interesting about that so i used to watch a show and i I, i'm not going to name it bit but because i don't want to be rude to the show but um it was very graphic it was about you know finding you know serial killers and um one of the main stars in the show was um mandy patikin i I don't think yeah yeah and he quit after a couple of years, he said, because he just didn't think it was good for humans to think about these things so much. <laughs> uh, something to, along those lines about the, losing our humanity in order to, you know, watch these shows. And- no, I, no. And I know we're getting a little bit off, off the tangent here, but actually, I think we can bring this back to Robert Louis Stevenson. So I think I know the show you're talking about. And if you look at the history of mysteries, uh, we have always had the storytelling done from the perspective of the detective, the person who is solving the puzzle and um, uh, leading us to truth. We have many more stories now that are from the perspective of the killer and getting in the mind of the killer and trying yes. to understand how a killer yes. thinks. And I happen to think that that is very dangerous. I'm not saying you can never do it or that can't be well done. In theory, I suppose it could be done. But the danger is when you read a book or engage in a story, automatically you identify with the main character. It, it just, you just do. <laughs> and so if your main character is bad, you're going to start relating to that, to their internal logic, especially if they even are trying to show what a crazy person thinks like. I just think there's a lot of damaging, damaging things there. That is not um, the story moving from chaos to order, but right? you're entering the, the, the chaos of, of the mind of the killer. And again, I'm not saying it couldn't be done well and pulled off. I'm just thinking, like you said, there's a lot of shows. As, an, uh, as a big principle, it, that works, yes. Right. So yeah, all this, we're going to profile the killer. We're going to get into the mind of the killer, you know. There's a reason why police detectives burn out and have a short career that it, it is. I mean, that's noble work, obviously, to put, you know, fine murderers, but it, it does have a, an effect on their soul. And they do get worn down by, you know, have, having to come into contact with that kind of evil. But that's part of their real job. And, and it's a very different thing for us to just indulge in that for entertainment. I think that there's something dangerous there. 
And so I do think that that goes back to Robert Louis Stevenson. So we do, we get a whole bunch of narratives. We never get hides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we are, we know Hyde's thoughts through Jekyll saying, I was horrified when I realized I thought X, Y, and Z, but we're not actually getting it from the perspective of Hyde who is delighting in it. And this is what he's feeling in the moment. So we, we do have a little bit of distance there. And also since Hyde is meant to be an embodiment of um, essentially pure evil, I would think that from an, on an artistic level, it would be, be so hard, cool. it would be yeah. hard to represent that. Um, Much more interesting to have Jekyll be kind of without torn him, about without him becoming cartoonish or something. No, exactly, exactly. So, so let's talk about how this story unfolds. So, last time we saw Hyde increasingly described as a beast, a monster, a demon, satanic. So, as you say, you know, so so pure evil. And what we see as the story unfolds is actually he says at one point when he has his first. Um, experiment that he feels liberated mm -hmm. because he separated his evil and his good side. He says, I'm, I'm liberated. And we already know though, because the story is told on the out of order that he is enslaved and Correct. that, and of course that is just the perfect image. It's what all the classical and medieval writers tried to say about the nature of sin, that it disguises itself as a path to liberty. And every time it enslaves you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No, that's, that's perfect. Um, one of the, th so I got a couple of different thoughts. I want to talk about the Renaissance view of man, because I think that's kind of happening in this story as well. Shout out to Emily Rabel, who pointed out to me that there was something similar happening in here that is happening in Paradise Lost. And I thought that was well said, but I also noticed this time how much this is the language of drug addiction, mm. which of course was ransacking England with opium at this time, opium and laudanum. And also uh, the tendency in um, Jekyll's pursuit of you know, perfecting the experiment uh, to yield diminishing returns, yes. as again with yes. addiction. Mm -hmm. um, and then he's got to have more and, and more of the drug. More, le or less and less effective for yep. him. Mm -hmm. um, and then he very quickly he goes from, I'm in control of this. I'm he even says at one point, actually it's in chapter three, he says, I can get rid of Hyde anytime I want. I mean, that is uh -huh. the language of addiction right there. Right? I can spend right. time I right. want. I'm in control of this. I am just indulging in this little dark side, um, which I appreciated. Robert Louis Stevenson doesn't, he doesn't tell us what are all the dark things that Jekyll was indulging in. I think a modern story would definitely have shown us that. I, I didn't review the, um, I didn't review our uh, recording from last week. Did we mention at all that um, Stevenson himself, um, it's been speculated was on, oh, not that Stevenson was an addict, but was, was on a, a doctor prescribed um, cocaine regimen. We didn't talk time. about that, but I wondered if he knew something of the effect of drugs. I wouldn't be surprised he if was, he had consumption. He was, well, I would yes, if he was under, I mean, at that time, almost anything they were going to give him was going to be harmful to right. him. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I would not be surprised if they gave him laudanum to sleep. Yeah. Something like that, which is super addictive. A lot of people got addicted to doctor prescribed drugs in this time period and the way he describes his inspirations also i mean it's, it's, he talked about his brownies uh that, that you know the little scottish fairies that come to you and he's, so he said often often during sickness you know during uh periods when he was only enjoying a kind of um marginal consciousness that's when a lot of his best stories came to him uh, and would, again i mean he wasn't he wasn't a habitual drug abuser or something like that i don't want to give that impression but uh yeah um yeah some of but his... he was chronically ill and was medicated yeah exactly a lot. so right. right so he would have definitely been someone who possibly knew at least knew the effect that drugs have on a person mm -hmm. so he very quickly goes from i'm in control of this i'm still essentially jekyll the good guy but i'm just indulging in things and he talks a lot about he had an inscrutable mask he's mm -hmm. other other people pay people to do their crimes for them so they can keep their hands clean and their name clean and i figured out a way to do it even safer than that and so very quickly though he moves from i mean we see he's less and less in control of this then and that the more that he indulges it the physically the bigger hide gets because he was a dwarf because Jekyll did, was basically a good guy and didn't indulge those parts of himself. And the more he indulged him, the bigger he got. 
And we also notice that even when Jekyll is himself, he's a diminished yep. Jekyll. He's a weaker, he's amazing. He doesn't look well. His friends obviously that there's something wrong with him. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, I think that's something new for me this time around. I always think of it as Dr. Jekyll was this good guy and Mr. Hyde was a bad guy. But we clearly see in this story that Jekyll really was diminished and he wasn't, he wouldn't have gotten himself into this high position if he hadn't, you know, if, if there hadn't been, um, if he hadn't been a lesser person than he was. And even his strong desire not to get rid of Hyde, but to That's protect right. him and in case something happened, I think that was really interesting what he doesn't like is that Hyde is getting out of control and just like an addict he's like I can't I can't I can't cut him out I can't just go cold turkey and the fact that they had a shared memory so Jekyll is he's equal parts horrified and can't walk away from his behavior with Hyde as it gets worse and worse he's repulsed and fascinated by what he becomes Mm -hmm. when the uh when the well, during his fix, as it were. Right. Yeah. I agree with you, Cindy. I think I used to think heck, Jekyll was good and Hyde was bad, and that it really struck me this time how Jekyll was already giving into some sinful temptation when he decided to do the experiment. He would, his desire was to be able to indulge his bad side without having consequences. Right. And, and and did he feel like he, some like he was more concerned that he would go away and Hyde w- would be left? Then d- is that what he saw as happening? He would become more and more Hyde, and so he wanted to make sure he had money. Is is that why he was so concerned about um, that situation? It was an eventuality. He was. Um, he, it was an eventuality he had considered. Obviously, I think. So uh, at, at that point, he's culpable of knowing that he, you know, that this guy's bad and he's going to do everything he can to take care of him. Right. And uh, he thinks, but he knows, right? He says, I'm a man divide. I can go one of two ways. I can go all the way back to Jekyll or I can go all the way to Mr. Hyde. And he kind of like does a little pros and con column. And it's not just like, oh, I don't want to be this bad guy and I'm going to hurry up and be Jekyll. He, he's really torn about it. So you get the feeling that he is thinking about losing Jekyll and being Hyde full time. The only reason he gives that up entirely is because Hyde commits a murder and now he's going to get the death penalty. And so it's in a weird way, it's self-preservation why Hyde just doesn't take over all the time. Right. So now Hyde has to hide. Exactly. Instead of Jekyll. Right, so the mask that Jekyll had doesn't work. Now Hyde desperately needs the Jekyll mask just to just to stay alive. And speaking of the really good um, picture of addiction, and I do think there's just a ton of similarity between the way you become enslaved to sin and the way you become addicted cutting to Cutting himself off from his friends also. Yeah. Oh, yes, cutting himself mm-hmm. off his friends. But then when he gets clean, right, mm-hmm. he has his two months of getting clean, but he's thinking yes. about going back. I mean, isn't this the story? Sure. So many people, this is where they die from, from drug addiction because, th- because when you get clean and then you go back, it has a much worse effect on you than if you had just been addicted the whole time. It's, it's this terrible irony when you read stories of people who, oh, they were clean for so long and mm-hmm. they just took one hit and died. But that's exa- it's because it is way more powerful at that point. You're in a much more vulnerable situation. Wait, just let me finish the thought. So, um, no, I think I may have lost it. Um, oh, how? So he, he gets clean for a while and then he gives in. And the way he describes that, you know, Hyde was in fury. He was raging because he had been caged for a while. Oh, yeah. Paranoid and resentful. Yes. The more you talk about this, the more I'm happy that this story isn't contemporary, because if it were, there would be inevitably the scene where... Uh, Jekyll's friends come and say, Henry, this is an intervention. <laughs> we have but, to get you into the But we almost have here. that when Utterson goes and confronts him and says, I don't think this is a good relationship you're yeah. having. Uh-huh. I think your life is in danger. I don't think this is, I don't think this is good. Mm-hmm. That's true. So uh, one, one of the things that, oh, oh go ahead, go ahead. I just, I should have mentioned this last time. It's um, kind of I, I, it kind of surprised me this time around the way that Utterson's character is introduced because one of the first things he tells you about himself um, that he has this kind of phlegmatic 
tolerance that he doesn't really mind other people's vices and you know has kind of a live and let live attitude towards his even his close acquaintances and he said that generally he is happy to let his brother go to the devil in his own way oh um and here you know here throughout the course of the story he's forced to watch that it precisely that thing happen oh that's really good so just flipping through my book i see that i've also noted that so to go to our idea our idea of is dr jekyll good and mr hyde bad that one of the things jekyll notices is that when he switches back to jekyll he's a bad version of himself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so even the jekyll starts to act like hyde and so hyde's taking over both personalities whereas jekyll did not temper and be in control so i like you know, we always see the good part of ourselves is so much stronger than the other parts and we can handle it. We can just indulge a little bit in a safe way and not be destroyed by it. Um, so getting back to this Renaissance idea, which is actually really, really simple with similar to, to the drug addiction idea here. So we've talked before about the Renaissance and medieval idea of what is a, a well-ordered man. And that's somebody who, um, in a nutshell without getting into all the ins and outs of it it's a man who is in control of his passions so mm -hmm. a properly ordered man um, has reason at the top uh, and reason does not mean pure intellect or logic reason means um, the image of god in us so so reason would include our mind uh, but it would also include things like divine revelation which modern people don't think of that as a subset of reason at all but in other words the divinely revealed order of the world through revelation through you know looking at the creation through the minds that were given um that should be what's guiding us as human beings under that is our will um i was actually explaining this in my paradise lost class um interesting you'll like this cindy and so many of the kids in there have had a charlotte mason education and they all said oh charlotte mason talks about the will all the time and we actually had a really good conversation about the will um because they had already been introduced to this idea so the will then is kind of your force of action. So through my reason, I decide what is the right way to behave. And then my will, I determine to act that way. And the passions are at the bottom. Um, the passions are not necessarily evil, um, but they have to be evaluated by the reason. So if I'm feeling love, for example, um, if if the object of that love is good and appropriate then my reason will will say oh yes this is a this is a good love and i'll use my will and i'll act upon it if it's love of you know wealth or ambition or power or something like that um your reason would say oh nope that's a that's a destructive passion and i'm not going to use my will to act on that so that's the image of a well-ordered man so a disordered man could be disordered in two ways and i think actually that robert lewis stevenson shows us both of those um, the most obvious way is he flips upside down. So instead of his reason ruling him, his passions are ruling him. Mm -hmm. And there's a tons of great images in medieval literature about like, oh, um, for example, if I, you meet a knight in armor, but he doesn't have a helmet on, that's mm. somebody that's not being ruled by reason, right? His, his head armor is gone. Uh, he might also be on a horse that's running wildly. That was also a image of somebody being ruled by their passions, right? The horses are dragging you along. Um, or a bubbling stream that's kind of running over its boundaries. That would be passions overflowing. So, so that's the most obvious way. And of course, we see that here. But the other way, and we ended up having a really good conversation about this in class, and I think you're going to have some things to say about this, Cindy. That's obvious when somebody's being ruled by their passions, right? Lust, you know, greed, gluttony, pride. That's Ambition. obvious. <laughs> Ambition. That's obvious. Um, where it gets to be so much easier to be deceived even about ourselves is when the disorder comes from the fact that you don't have a strong will, that your weak is will, um, your will is weak. But my students really, um, I was really proud of them. They, they were very honest about themselves and they're admitting that they really, that they often suffer from weak wills. And I said, that, well, this would be an example of, so sometimes you know something is wrong like you know it's wrong to murder okay nobody thinks it's right to murder um but you just do it anyway right because you're ruled by your anger or whatever or your wrath and so you just do it um that's that's one kind of disordered uh sinful situation the other is when you know full well it's wrong 
and you just lack the will to control yourself. So it's not that your passions are run out of control. You just have a weak will. It's the whole like, well, I really, I know this is the right thing to do, but I just can't bring myself to do it. I see the better path, but do not take it as often said. Oh, perfect. I mean, yeah, definitely this is a Charlotte Mason concept that overrides almost everything she says. The way of the will is one of her her main, you know, thesis points. And um, it, it's painful sometimes to read Charlotte Mason when she talks about the will because she really brings it up as we are responsible for our behavior and our character is important and good habits are there to help us sustain our will Um, and all of those things are not you know cheerful fun easy things those are things that require work on our part and that we do have choices to make and we do have disciplines that can help us be better people rather than just go along with the flow and honestly I think this ties in greatly and I say this with with a measure of empathy for for our culture and not trying to just diss it but I talk a lot lately about this idea that we have this therapeutic culture Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with because we don't know what to do with our passions Um, and and those and and we don't have the tools and we don't have a will we are weak people (laughs) and not one we cause damage and that damage leads to you know the therapeutic culture and two we we take we're, we're too we're too tender that everything we do um, is neat, you know, I don't know how to put it in words that don't sound really terrible. So I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> <laughs> I think we see the interplay of both of those um, disordered situations in this story though. Yeah. Um, because we do see Jekyll he does know what the right thing to do is and he lacks the will to do it at several key places in the story. Yeah, in a way you could say that Hyde has a strong will, like um, a will to evil, but it, but it, so he is the stronger because he has a will to do bad and mm-hmm. he succeeds at it. Whereas Jekyll has a kind of half-hearted will to do good and he doesn't succeed at it. And I think uh, Lewis's uh, image here of Hyde as dwarfish and Jekyll as big because, and again, this is the idea of strengthening and and are strengthening or weakening your will. So so he had lived a life of Jekyllness, right? So even though he definitely wasn't good in his heart, certain social forms forced him to not indulge in all the evil he might want to. And so because of that, he had a strong will. And we don't really think about it, but the, the cultural mores actually were helping him have a strong will. I'm not going to murder somebody because I'm going to get caught. I'm not going to go to this opium den because it'll destroy my reputation. Maybe those are not the most moral reasons, but they are reasons. And they did, they did strengthen him. So he had self-control enough to say, well, I don't want to destroy myself. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop short of that. Um, and then Hyde had the smaller will at the beginning because it had not been indulged. And then you see the more he goes, the stronger Hyde's will become. That line where he says, initially, what was hard was to throw off the Jekyll side. But right. later, it became harder and harder to throw off the Hyde. And that is such a brilliant picture of how you get enslaved to your passions, whatever mm-hmm. they are. Um and you do, you, you think you're on the path to liberty and then you find out you're a total slave. And he becomes not just a metaphorical slave to hide. He's literally trapped in his room and can't get out. Right, right. Well, also this relates to another story, which is the Lord of the Rings and the idea that um, especially we see Bilbo um, with the ring and he begins to see that um, he he's using the ring has power and it's you could say neutral in some ways but the more the more he uses it for for good things the 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 stronger the power over him becomes and 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 in the end he knows that that will destroy him Mm -hmm. And and tolkien's insight there that the more powerful the ring becomes the less of a human you become those shadow people as they fade yeah and I think we see that with, with Jekyll here. I think we definitely see the same idea um, 
and the ring for Tolkien was a was a metaphor for evil and technology, and you know here it, it, it's science, but um, it, it doesn't matter what the thing is. The point is when you indulge, even for good reasons, and all those stories we're talking about, people have good reasons for it initially. Yeah, I think that's why I really like the use of the ring and the Hobbit. And it's so down to earth and earthy and we it's not an overarching story where it's going to be thrown into the fire of Mount whatever doom or whatever it's called. Um, but we just see this simple guy using this ring of power for to do, you know, fun things and also good things. Um, and we don't quite see, you know, there's something big that's going to happen because of that. But at first, it's just it's just a, a homey, good story. It's uh, all this talk about um, people who are corrupted by some kind of miraculous acquisition, uh, which gives them leverage over their peers. I, the original of this type of character, would you say it's Faust? Mm. I, I'm trying to think of you know, like the, the earliest example of this type of character, you know, the, um, the, the person who, someone with scientific leanings or intellectual abilities beyond the ordinary, um, acquires some invention or um, discovers some new power, which over the course of time um, it acts as a corrosive on his soul. You might be right. I mean, so it's like, like Frankenstein. It, it, I mean, Frankenstein. She had been reading Faust, I believe, before uh, shortly before she she wrote her own book. Yeah. So and is Faust based on anything? That's uh, what I'm trying to think. I mean, but, Frankenstein is it's also a Prometheus myth. But yeah. I, but Pro Pro Prometheus myth is a little. It's a little bit different. Prometheus isn't. Yeah, corrupted. From Zeus's perspective, um, Prometheus has corrupted, but not from yeah. From the story's perspective, he was a, it was a gift. Yeah, because he's not stealing it for himself. He gives right. fire to men. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it, that, so he, that's something to be. I'm I'm going to keep my eyes out now. Here's a story. Also, I I uh, I don't only remember this today um, when I was looking at some notes for this, but. Um, in addition to the most famous version of the Faust legend, um, Goethe also uh, wrote The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Oh. Which I guess you could say is kind of Faust on a miniature, um, huh. you know, kind of, uh, well, maybe, maybe a cuter scale. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> you know, Faust, Faust retold as a comedy in miniature form. So Jekyll has wanted to keep this identity secret so that he could maintain respectability obviously his hand gets forced and he can't like you said his friends know something's wrong um honestly at the beginning just his associate his known association with Hyde calls his character into question and his friends think the best and they think he must be being blackmailed or something because they can't imagine my friend the upstanding Dr. Jekyll would have anything to do with this you know gangster looking guy um and in a sense you could say that he is because one side of his personality is, you know, convincing the other that it needs it. Mm. You know, the, the 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 good half needs the evil half to be to remain the good half to retain its uh to retain it to retain its uh more, what it sees as its moral purity. I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so he starts off with wanting a secret identity, but in the end reveals the whole story to his friends he has to he's forced right. to he's and so the first one he reveals it to is lanyon and it destroys him mm -hmm. so the the forbidden knowledge that destroys jekyll also is now destroying other people of course people get murdered by Hyde, but in this case this is jekyll's friend and when he becomes a sharer of the knowledge he's corrupted by it and mm -hmm. it kills him yeah, that was quite a twist. That was that was an interesting twist uh, in the story. I mean, a kind of unexpected incident. It is unexpected, and he doesn't develop it super much. But no. you, you you do see this idea in Renaissance and medieval stories, especially in Shakespeare. Um, you know, as moderns, we have such a sense that everything I do is private, right? All of my actions are private. I'm an an, an autonomous individual. Um, and so you shouldn't be concerned with any action I make because it only affects me and, and, and me. And um, what the older writers show is that 
even if you're sinning against your own soul, it does have an effect on other people and on the world as a whole and on your relationships. And it, and it does, like you said with Dr. Jekyll, it does isolate you from community and friends. It does affect your friends in a bad way. Um, of course, you know, in the Renaissance, they would have a, a whole sense that um, if your personal soul is disordered, you're going to see that effect of that on a cosmic level. Right, and that the, the the big problems in the world really all boil down to the fact that we as individuals ha have disordered souls. Um, one of the great um, recurring ideas in Shakespeare's play, and and oh, I mean, it's just so it's, it's something we need to hear constantly right now, is, is when he has his characters look at war, civil war, you know, horrible, horrible things happening in the world in these plays. His answer is always that the solution to huge problems is a small, small solution, not, not a big, mm -hmm. not a big solution, right? Um, that, that if you want a properly ordered government, because he deals with civil war a lot in his stories, if you want a properly ordered government, it has to start with your personally properly ordered soul. Mm. Wow. Um, and so all of these things are super connected. And like I said, he doesn't in this story develop it a huge amount, but I did think it was a nice tip of the hat to this idea when we see that Jekyll's behavior is affecting more than just himself. I mean, honestly, his servants were in danger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you they know, had to feel discouraged. <laughs> What's that? No, go ahead, Thomas. Oh, no, I was going to say, I, I, quite, uh, I quite like Poole as a character. I, um, you know, one, one, could, one could wish for, uh, one could wish for uh, you know, such a uh, such a Jeeves. Everyone needs a pool or a Jeeves in their life. Perhaps. I got to say that one of my adult students, um, so we're just like three or four classes into the year now, and, and um, I had taught them the principle that literary illusions are intentional. And so she came, and I thought this was very, very well done. So shout out for this. But she said, as when she was reading the story, as soon as she saw that the servant was named Poole, she thought of Grace Poole from Jane Eyre and immediately oh. thought, this is a servant who's basically hiding a mad person in the that attic. That was a really brilliant which, deduction. Very yeah, brilliant. I would, wow. never, I would never have that. that. I want to know her name. Oh, let me pull up my messages. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, no, it's okay. I should have checked. I should have checked. I'm terrible at remembering names. Y'all go ahead and talk while I look it up. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say that that's probably probably the smartest thing that's been said about this this story so far since we that started, started it off. Wow. Also shows me I have to read Jane Arrigan at some point. Yeah, that was Amy DeBoer from my job, Amy. class. Excellent job. Yeah, that was brilliant. That but was absolutely brilliant. Amy, way to outsmart all three of us put together. Amy, we have now hired you and we are refiring. <laughs> <laughs> The, the student has passed become the teacher. Right? That's hey, that's that's always our goal, right? Um, but but yeah, that was an allusion there to, to Jane Eyre and and a secret in this house. And mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah, that was that was well done. Okay, so let's get to the ending then. So he's totally compromised now. Hyde is taking control and and is is turning back to Hyde without Jekyll doing it. He doesn't need the drug anymore now. Mm -hmm. Basically, now he needs to take the drug if he wants to, that, to return. To yep. Jekyll. And man, if that is not a picture of drug addiction, huh? Yeah. That you just, oh, you're so strung out. The only time you feel somewhat normal is when you're on the drug. So, yeah, Hyde is now completely in control of the person he's taking the drug to try to be Jekyll. And he runs out. And the twist is he cannot get any of the stuff because there obviously was some secret ingredient. That was just really well done, Lewis. That was so clever. So now he can't. The, the, the science has failed him and he, he is no longer in control of this experiment. Mm. The monster is out. But the dilemma being that the monster can't fully be out because he'll be arrested. Mm -hmm. So he locks himself up in the attic. So the, 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 mad, the mad doctor in the attic here and he's locked up in there. And of course... Dr. Jekyll's servants are very concerned and they go to get Utterson and they think this is so well done. They think they are liberating their friend, but really they've just signed his death warrant when mm -hmm. they break into the room. Yeah. Because he's determined that, you know, it, it, he's reached the point where he, uh, you know, he's not willing to be taken alive and uh, uh, death is better than capture. Yeah. I was going to ask you, why do you think Hyde kills himself? Because, because we do find out 
at the end, and this was a twist for me because I had misremembered the ending. I had remembered that the better part of him as Jekyll is like, I'm not going to let this monster live. And that is not what happened. Jekyll writes at the end of the letter, well, I'm signing off now. This is the last I'll ever be Jekyll. And now I'm going to be Hyde and it remains to be seen if Hyde will figure out a way out of this or if he'll take his own life. Mm-hmm. So Hyde is Hyde killed himself. I, I don't think it's from a noble motive. No, I, I I honestly I think he just didn't want to be caught and face yep. justice. Maybe I'm oversimplifying, but I, I don't. And I think it. that also suicide is the ultimate, you know, um, evil in some ways. It's not the ultimate evil, but it it that this especially in this situation. I mean, there's all kinds of suicides that aren't, um, you know, that are based on you know just someone's mind being sick, which this isn't a, certainly not a healthy mind. Right, right. At this time, the church would have considered suicide a, t- a mortal sin. Mm-hmm. And so he is committing the ultimate mortal sin. That He's already committed all the other sins. Now he can commit this final sin. Right. Hyde is not suffering from some sort of mental, mental illness or trauma or something. He's no, in no, full possession no. of his faculties. And this is an act of rage. Um, and oh, I think what is a picture of is the the again again again, going back to dante going back to the church fathers that all sin is essentially an act of self-destruction so everything hyde has been doing has been killing jekyll right right and this is just finishing it off i know of course we and in some ways we can't understand it because we we think of him as a narcissist who would do anything to continue but in other ways, it makes complete sense because it is the it is what he's been doing all along. Right, right. What a what a powerful story. I mean, the the, the quote I read at the beginning about you know storytellers show not what happens but what always happens. I I think this is a, absolutely a perfect perfect story. I'm on I'm on Team C.S. Lewis here when he says this is a perfect story. This is a perfect story to show what always happens you mm-hmm. always think you can indulge and be in charge and and you're not um i felt a lot of echoes of the great divorce too in here mm-hmm. yeah definitely and i yeah i think it's i think lewis was was right when he talked about this being a modern myth mm-hmm. you know, where, where the form of the story is um of greater fundamental importance than the uh uh, the literary, the, 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 the high or low literary power with which it's presented. And uh, it, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, set in what was to, uh, what was to Stevenson, the everyday modern world of uh, London suburbs and London fog and all that kind of thing. But at the same time, it seems like it's the kind of story that seems um, in terms of the, uh, the motives of the characters, the, you know, the the way the story develops, so almost almost like it could belong to to folklore in a way, or to um, some some yeah, earlier stage of take a culture. magic potion. Yeah, I mean, and I was thinking, you know, at, and looking at some some forms of of folk literature or um, you know legend, uh, uh, like the some of the some of the medieval uh, Jewish legends about the golem take mm-hmm. on this kind because of, it's it'll usually be like a rabbi of exceptional, you know, intelligence um, creates this, this being, this superhuman being to do his bidding and then loses control of it. That's, I mean, that's the, that's the classic oh. golem myth. Um, oh, that's good. Yeah. And maybe it's, it's evidence of the fact that the story is mythic, that it both seems really old and really new at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think right. So. Like I could imagine turning on Netflix tonight and seeing the new movie about, you know, scientists invents pill and you take the pill and now you're a different person. And so you can just do whatever you want. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, actually, yeah. OK, I'll stop there. Oh, <laughs> is, is that is that a movie? No, I just have heard, you know, some, you know, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories going around now. And some of them are. And of course, they're you know, there's all kinds of science conspiracy theories because, you know, we're in an age of science and we, we're, we're hoping science will save us and we're hoping, you know, all kinds of things. But um, every around every corner, there's some, you know, savior in the form of science. And I, it, I don't, I, don't, I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> Well, no, but I think I think the principle that you're getting at is the same principle that Louis Stevenson and Mary Shelley were also getting at. Um, 
that, that there's a lot of danger in scientific discovery. There's a lot we don't know. And that doesn't mean you say no to science. Yeah, yeah. It means you have a reverential caution about the things that you're, you're playing with, right? Um, things are made in labs that escape the lab. <laughs> You don't say, uh, you know, and, 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 and this happens in stories all the time. So, uh, thank goodness we have stories to tell us, you know, that things that are made in labs escape from labs. Well, exactly. Exactly. And, and, um, I, I don't, I mean, I think it's wisdom to, to understand that the noblest scientific endeavors can easily get out of hand. Mm-hmm. Um, especially if you don't have a real reverential caution about what you're doing. And and I'm not saying that all scientists everywhere are just, you know, mad sign. They're, they're not, but uh, you know, there's many, many very sincere and, and, and cautious and and wise scientists that I'm not talking about that, but there's a reason we have the mad scientist archetype. Yeah. I mean, I mean, when you think about just even, um, you know the, the the science that leads to war machinery of war and how mm-hmm. how how in some ways it might be it save people and in some ways it can cause so much you know terrible destruction well right and when you realize that the scientists who were involved in the manhattan project when you read their stories how absolutely conflicted and torn up they were about it um, yeah and you know, ultimately it was politicians and military people that made the decision of what to do with their science. But um, I would say that they, they knew that there was a, a huge significance to, the, to, their, to their work and that there were gonna be consequences and that some of the moral responsibility for that was on, was on them. And I, I know that that's not an easily answered question about that particular case with the atomic bomb, but Yes. Um, I was going to say Alfred Nobel of Peace Prize fame. Uh, he also was the inventor of dynamite. W- was he not? Oh, was he? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. And, no, and he again, was. He was. Yes. That's and that's what made me think of it. How um, you know he he invented this. I don't know if it was dynamite, but um, it was something like that. And contributed to the uh, yeah to the science of ballistics and. Uh, regretted it later in life Um, well so this actually came up in my paradise last class this week too that um so when milton is describing the war in heaven he makes a case that um satan and the demons invented gunpowder and cannons and it's actually a scene that tolkien lifted almost just entire in its entirety for the helm's deep episode with the orcs uh, but the demons are the, the ones acting like the orcs here and so we were talking about that and 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 sort of the long-standing view um, that 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 kind of weaponry was satanic. Um, and you could see how that definitely captured Lewis and, and Tolkien's um, imagination, especially coming out of uh, World War I. Um, but, you know, I, w- I was thinking about that in class, like, you know, the Chinese invented fireworks. Like, that's cool. That's awesome. And somebody looked at that and was like, that is really cool. I bet I could kill someone with that. You know, it was like a five-year-old kid just kind of tucked that, you know, yeah. away and said, "Oh man, it'll be cool when I grow up." I'm going to for every boy yeah. that has shot his neighbor with a Roman candle, right? Um, I literally did. That I as know, a kid. I know yeah. you did. I was thinking about that. Um, but the point Our, is, fireworks are dangerous, children. <laughs> well, and sure. And so the point is, I, I guess this is a distinction we need to make. Maybe it's not the science that's dangerous. Maybe it's the scientist <laughs> that is, is that's there. It's the it's the it's it's the fallen human beings who, who are the problem because we can continue to find ways to take good and beautiful things and use them to destroy ourselves with. Well, and that goes back to the Bible verse that says, even the creation groans. Um, there, there are these things in creation that are groaning to be to be really good, um, but but the because of the fallen nature of the world, and you know, they are used for evil. I've never really thought of the verse in uh, this light before, but that text from Romans, you kind of wonder, is creation groaning from pain or from, uh, you know, eye-rolling disgust? Like, oh my (laughs) gosh, humans again. Are they really using, yeah. um, Yeah. mm -hmm. Oh no, groan. Like teenage groan. (laughs) Dad joke groan. (laughs) Oh. 
Well, do we have any final comments about this? I really enjoyed rereading it. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. And it, I, I'm always I'm always pleased to to read Stevenson again. I, I mean, I don't read a book of his every month, but uh, every time I, I do pick him up again, I'm always uh, surprised and delighted. I should probably follow up on my comments last week about having read Dorian Gray at the same time as this book. And there were a couple of people in the Lit Life Facebook group who are also reading Dorian Gray and and um, found that the comments I made last week were very helpful for them to understand it. And I don't want to, I'm not going to spoil the ending of Dorian Gray, so don't worry. We, we may have actually spoiled the Jane Eyre today. Sorry about that. I just assume everybody knows all these things. Um, but Oscar Wilde is doing something very different. I mean, very similar, not different, similar. Like he's not using science, but he is, uh, his is more magic. It's more Faustian really. But it's the it's, same desire of yes. the heart. It, it, well, he has character, Henry. So it's a lot, a lot more like Mephistopheles and Faust, how he does it. But the point is the same that Dorian Gray becomes a divided self. And he thinks that he has an impenetrable mask that will allow him to indulge in all of you know, his sinful desires without consequence. And what he discovers is, even if no one knows, and even if you can get away with it, that doesn't mean it's not without consequence, that it does affect your soul. And so he, Dorian Gray ends up having a very metaphorically similar ending to, to this story. Um, and so I think all of those guys are tracking with the same thing, that these are all acts of self-destruction you cannot indulge in these sinful desires safely and be in control of them like you think. They will take over and they will corrupt you. And whatever good was in you to begin with, it's gonna, it's gonna snuff it out. Yeah, yeah. Well, all right, Lewis Stevenson, now that we know for <laughs> sure what to call you. Um, so that wraps up our, that wraps up our summer series. Can I, it's September, but it's still technically summer. Yeah, it's so, not It's not over yet. The it's summer. Not, no, you're on the beach. You're still having that summer life. I literally painted my fingernails orange this morning. Like I'm just trying to, I'm willing autumn to happen. I've got autumn colors on. I got my wreath. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, but um, so what do we have coming up? Again, if you're looking for our schedule, you can find it on our website, theliterary.life. You can also sign up for our weekly newsletter at houseofhumaneletters.com. We put together a really nice list of all the things we've got going on, which includes podcast schedules for both the well-read poem and the lit life. It has the narration pages for the well-read poem. So we have schedules and links and um, all kinds of freebies in there and, and things that we've got going on the poems Mr. Banks is publishing, all kind of good stuff. So you'll want to sign up for that and you can have the um, Lit Life podcast schedule dropped in your mailbox. It will also be um, in the Facebook group. So, but we'll give you a little tease of what's coming up next. So we're going to take a, a two week break and then we are going to come back with Jane Austen's Mansfield Park. And I'm very excited to read this with you guys. Um, well, I'm sure we'll talk about this next week, but I just finished rereading. That was my goal. I reread all of Jane Austen's novels. And so I'm super pumped to talk about this one and, and what I think she's doing here as opposed to what she's doing in her other novels. I, I think, and this is, a, this is a, a problem novel for a lot of people and we'll explore why, why that is and um, how I think we're supposed to read it. So that'll be coming up October 5th. So you can get the actual chapters on our schedule, but it's gonna be roughly the first half of volume one. Um, we'll also be taking a break about halfway through that series um so the week of halloween we're going to do a halloween episode with an edgar Allan poe short story and i'm very excited about that and then we'll finish up mansfield park and then we'll announce the stuff that's coming for the rest of the year after that so you can find that in the usual places literary.life um which is our website where you can find not only the schedule but our commonplace quotes the poem mr banks reads at the end uh, links to the books we mentioned, all that good stuff. That's your source. Oh, and I want to mention a few people have said they can't figure out how to contact us. You can contact us through our own personal website. So morningtimeformoms.com with Cindy, houseofhumaneletters.com for us. Um, we all, we have big old contact buttons if you want to get in touch with us. So that's what we've got going on. Mr. Banks is going to have a poem ready for us to go at the end here. Thanks always to our patrons for supporting this podcast. Uh, we are 100% member supported and we thank you. Thank you for rating, reviewing, and subscribing to this podcast. Thank you for reading along with us. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook. So we'll meet you right back here in two weeks with some Jane Austen. Until then, keep crafting your literary life because stories will save the world.
The Land of Nod by Robert Louis Stevenson. From breakfast on through all the day, at home among my friends I stay. But every night I go abroad, afar into the land of Nod. All by myself I have to go, with none to tell me what to do. All alone beside the streams and up the mountain sides of dreams. The strangest things are there for me both things to eat and things to see, and many frightening sights abroad till morning in the land of Nod. Try as I like to find the way, I never can get back by day, nor can remember plain and clear the curious music that I hear.